let me just tell you where this session came from. Um, we went out, as many of you, I hope, were participating in this. We went out two times for folks asking what topics you wanted explored on this day. So this is not coming out of our brain. We went out and we asked people. And we had an overwhelming number of people say, you know, we need to get the conversation to the C-suite. We need to have the conversation in the C-suite. And we also want to understand what is our journey. You know, is this a, is this a role? Is there skill set? Is there something we need to go where we want to go? And so we went out there and we found four individuals that we felt could give us some really good insight. And we've asked them to do what we call the sexy talks, which are 10-ish 10-ish, 10 to 12 minutes a piece, no more than that. And they're going to each talk on a specific theme that relates to them. We're going to be monitoring the Q&A. We're going to have a Q&A time afterwards. We're going to let them go one, two, three, four, and then um, break and have a conversation. Our goal here is to satisfy that idea of how do I get that conversation at the C-suite? How do I maybe get to the C-suite so that I have a CRP coming to me for the conversation? But it's how do we elevate this conversation to the place that we need to do. So first I want to bring up to the front stage is a person who, um, oh man, I guess I've known her like forever. Um, one of the cool things is that she had a chapter that needed an exec director. She called me up. She said, Peggy, I might have a deal for you. And that is how we managed to have one of our incredible management clients that we've enjoyed um, working with, the Appraisal Institute of Metro DC. So I guess because she's part of the reason why I have the money, some of the money, not all the money, I can't give you credit for everything, um, could be why. But we also served together on the ASAE Component Section Council. Um, she also helped us get the volunteer uh, research through the ASAE Foundation through because she was on the research committee at the time. I just want you to know that the person you're gonna, who's going to be talking to you in just a moment is not only connected and not only smart and not only funny, but she was a CRP. And now she's a CEO. Words of wisdom from Sharon Kneebone. Please come on up. So as you can see up here, I started out in the deep end of the pool with no life preserver as a chapter executive director for an association management company, I kid you not. I want to start with my, everybody has their story, right, for component relations or for their, their big aha moment. And my first event that I had to um, put together was the Christmas party for the Maryland chapter of the Appraisal Institute. My boss at the time said, call the venue and give them the head count. I called the venue, I gave him the head count. Saturday evening, I'm home with my family decorating the Christmas tree. He calls me up, he says, where's the caterer? I said, what caterer? <laughs> no, they didn't ask me at, you know, when I called to give the numbers who, who the caterer was. Luckily, I had a background in the restaurant industry and happened to know of a very good place very close by. They were very smart. They got the bar over there first, and then they got the food. So that was my in the deep end with no life preserver story. So. I have a meandering story is it, my career. I started out as a chapter executive, and then I went to the Appraisal Institute where I became a component relations professional because I could walk the talk. I had run a chapter successfully. I had run state organizations sex successfully, and I started a CRP group from the ground up, and it was the most wonderful experience I've ever had. Um, so one of the things that you need to understand, regardless of where you sit, in the organization is that you never, ever, ever want to forget who the organization belongs to. You know, I could just get my job done if it weren't for those members. <laughs> <laughs> the organization belongs to the members always and foremost, and it is the board's job to set the vision and the mission and the strategic direction of the organization. It is our job as the chief staff executive or the component relations professional to implement that strategy really important. So this is me at a component event for IFT, Mike. That should look familiar. <laughs> um, I want to talk to you a little bit about going from the chapter executive to the CRP to the CEO. And it is the same skill set. The, the common thread is the skill set required. And you're always moving towards alignment. You are always moving towards the greater good of the order and making sure that the organization achieves its goal, 
its mission, mission and its vision. But what I really want to talk about is how do you get from the CRP suite to here, and it's the skill set. Think about what you do on a daily basis. You may be picking up one phone call and you're providing leadership counseling or training because that other person on the board won't give in, won't let us move forward, whatever that is. So you're dealing with these interpersonal relationships and helping these boards to move forward at a smaller level. You also need to be very good at finances. How many of you had to go into a chapter and take a look at their statement of activities and say, oh, Houston, we've got a problem? How many of you had to go in and say, okay, Houston, we've got a problem. Now you've got to help them clean it up, right? So that's your finance operations area. You just spent quite a bit of time talking about technology. How do we take and scale up technology that, as Peggy likes to say, meeting the chapters where they need to be, and you've got to figure out what are the best technology options for your chapters to use that are compatible with whatever the, org the main organization is doing. Because I've worked some places where, you know, parent organization has one way of doing things, components either have nothing or have their own way of doing things, and then you can't get the data to talk to each other. So now you're an IT manager as well. So how many of you are doing flyers and doing um, sample communications pieces for your chapters? How many of you copywriting for your chapters? You're also a marketing and communications department for them. So these are all things that you need to be aware of. I think the only skill that you really don't touch as much as a chapter executive that you have to be very familiar with as a CEO is the human uh, resources aspect of the job where you're really looking at the, the federal compliance, uh, the benefits, and all the fun stuff that goes with managing payroll, 401ks, and all of that. But guess what? You can hire someone to talk you through that and to teach you how to do it. So that's, that one is okay not to have so much of. You also, how many of you are helping your, I know Mike does this, because I worked at IFT for a little while too. How many of you are helping your chapter set up their own mini expos? So you are also the meetings and conference manager consultant for them. So you need to understand contracts. You need to understand how to negotiate. You need to understand if you've inherited a contract, um, how to help them make it better because they maybe signed not such a great deal, right? So how do you make it better? So move forward. It's always about leadership. This is my absolute favorite quote on leadership. Leadership is a process of social influence that maximizes the efforts of other towards the achievement of the goal. You are the catalyst. You are the person who is helping all these different cogs in the wheel that make the organization move forward, but you are doing it through exerting your influence and getting other people to come along on the ride with you. As CEOs, that's what we have to do on a daily basis. We are interfacing with our board of directors sometimes daily, sometimes weekly, depending on the organization or where you happen to be in your life cycle. You are doing the same thing with your chapters or whatever your component is called, you're doing the same thing. Ultimately, it is about leadership and it is about creating a vision. So this is what I, this is my, the main point from my talk that I want you to take away with you. CRPs manage from the bottom up. You're still looking at the greater, the greater good, how do we drive the mission forward, but you are doing it from a bottom-up approach and using the same skill sets. Leadership, volunteer management, public speaking, governance, finance, operations, marketing, communications. They're all skills that go along with being a CEO. The CEO, you're up here at a little bit higher level. The CEO manages from the top down. It is our job to look at the people that we have to work with, whether that's our staff, the volunteers, the chapters, state societies, whatever, whatever the different components are that make up your organization, we are doing it from the top down and we are deploying those resources from the top down to move the strategy of the board forward and the mission and the vision. So it is, you also have to learn how to talk the talk. So we talk a little bit differently from the bottom up than we do from the top down. So let's say I'm wearing my CRP hat and I'm going to my CEO and I need to ask for resources. 
I don't want to just go in and say, I need another $15,000 in the budget because I need to do a leadership training. You need to position that on why it is going to achieve the objectives. How many of you have an annual operating plan that you have to work from? Best tool ever. Because you use that annual operating plan to, from the bottom up, drive that mission forward and tie the need for leadership to the goals and objectives. And as a CEO, I want to hear it from you in quantifiable measurement. If you want that money, you need to quantify for me what that's going to do for the organization. It may be an investment where we may not get dollars back immediately, but it may be something that's a longer term return. Understand where your CEO is and what the same point is from looking up and the CEO will be looking down to help, <coughs> excuse me, to help guide you to make sure that you are successful as well. So, thank you. Let's continue to hear from our folks. So, let's see, what can I say about this next person? Hmm. Oh, okay, I'll keep it nice. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. So, um, I ran into Patrick, I think, just kind of inadvertently, and we've become best buddies, am I right? Absolutely. Absolutely. But your um, check is due, by the way. Okay, good. <laughs> so here's a person who is currently a CRP, but who recently went into his CEO's office, basically, and said, this is what I need, but he said it in the words that got what he needed. Now, I'm oversimplifying the process, but I asked him to share with you just a little bit about how he managed that conversation. And a lot of it has to do with... Uh, know what data you have on hand. That's right, thank you very much. Hey everybody, how are you? Okay, so we're in the afternoon lunch slump. How's everybody doing? Awesome, yes. So the most boring topic of the day is numbers and data, but it is also the most important thing that you need to uh, know and understand like the back of your hand. Um, I actually don't have any slides, no. There we go, okay. Um, and I did not put any slides together, um, so I welcome all your questions, one-on-one um, -on -one conversations, whatever you'd like to do. My history is a little bit different, it's a little bit unique. I actually started in the chapter system. Um, I became, I was in the travel industry, working in hotels, and they said, you have to join this association, and I was like, well, what is that? So my first meeting was their all-day education day. I showed up at 7.30. I walked in the room, didn't know anyone, and there was all of this hugs and you know laughter and whatever, and I was like, oh my God, who are these people? <laughs> so I went in there and I sat down at a table and <clears throat> didn't really talk to anybody, had a couple conversations, and everything was so over my head. I didn't know what I was doing there. I was second guessing why I even took this position. And at lunch, I'm not even joking you, I left at lunch, I went home, I crawled into bed in the fetal position, and I laid there for the rest of the day. Um, so, what's that? Introvert, Introvert yes. <laughs> At the time I was, who knew that this is where I would be today? Um, so, point number one um, for the CRPs to help coach and grow your people, um, regardless of, of where they want to go or where you want to go, um, is make sure you're, you're providing an open um, environment that's welcoming. Um, and you don't have the clicks going on because at any level that's really difficult to deal with. Um, so I, I st uh, stuck with that organization. A couple months later I got a tap on the shoulder from someone that said, hey, we have a treasurer position open and we'd like you to fill that. It's a great opportunity for personal and professional growth. And I was like, oh yeah, that sounds like an awesome idea. Great. Well, has anyone really done a treasurer position or like listened to a treasurer? It is not a fun and exciting position. It's very difficult. Um, we were actually doing all of our financials on Excel spreadsheets at the time um, and an access database, which are there people in the room that don't even know what an access database is? <laughs> Millennials? Yes, thank you. Um, and a rotary phone. Millennials, do you know what a rotary phone is? That one's my favorite. Um, so anyway, I went from treasurer um, and then I moved into um, a couple different board positions and finally became president of, of the local chapter. Um, things were going great. I ran for a second term. I lost. I was devastated. And I thought, okay, I'm done in this industry. I'm done with the association. 
Shortly after that, um, the company I was working for was purchased. The new management company chose not to retain me, so I found myself unemployed, back on the couch in the fetal position, going, oh my god, what am I going to do? I'm going to go uh, flip burgers at McDonald's because I needed income. So meanwhile, I stayed involved in the association, and I just used my extra time to volunteer, to get involved, expand my network, because I thought, who better that I should rub shoulders with than the people in the industry that I love and I want to stay with. So I attended conferences, I applied for scholarships, the whole nine yards. Unbeknownst to me, the people I was rubbing shoulders with are now sitting on the board of directors of the association that I work at. So I spent a year unemployed. Uh, the position came up. They came up to me and said, hey, we're thinking about this, um, this chapter position. Would you be interested? I said, yeah, sure, I need a job, whatever. Um, <laughs> And I was like, well, so I'm going to get paid for all this frustration that I go through as a volunteer? All right, I can deal with that too. <laughs> so I got hired, and you know, I had all these great relationships with all the presidents, all the members. Everything was going really well. And then it occurred to me that as staff, you don't quite get the same relationship as you do if you're a member, and members treat you very differently as staff. So I withdrew from a lot of relationships um, that I had, which was very difficult um, because the people that I, I was member or friends with for so many years were like true bosom buddy friends, right? Um, so that's been a difficult thing. Thankfully, some of those people have left the industry, so I've been able to rekindle those friendships, and I'm really happy about that. Um, but we started digging into things. I started getting busier and busier and busier. The chapters wanted more and more and more, and I'm only one person. I started with 39 chapters and affiliates, then I had our nine committees in the US added onto my plate, then I had the six European committees added onto my plate, then we started establishing task forces and other boards and advisory boards, and they were all falling under me. And I went to my boss and I said, I need help. I can't do this on my own. He's like, yep, just do what you can, make it happen, um, we'll look at getting you additional resource soon. I'm like, all right, I've heard the phrase soon before, you know, um, soon this, soon that. So I, every week in my one-on-one, -on -one, I would ask my boss, what do I need to do to get more resources? He's like, be more efficient, find more tools, automate, automate, automate. I'm like, I'm at the max capacity for automation. I don't know what else I can do. So then the board said, they looked at my budget and said, wow, he spent $50,000 on travel last year what's the ROI on that? And so we started down this road of data mining and finding out what we can do, how we can do it to prove what I'm doing and the value of my job. And to me, I'm thinking, great, I'm going to get laid off again and I'm going to be back on the couch in the fetal position. <laughs> so luckily, um, Peter had started working on this project about proving the ROI of chapters. And it all kind of melded and came together at the same time where we were working on the same project. Now, the one difference between, and is everyone familiar with the project I'm talking about that Peter is, to, yes, no? No? Okay. 12 minutes, is that okay? I'm not going to get this done in 10. Fine? Okay. So, um, so it's me about measuring the ROI of your chapters using data and, um, and what you have at your fingertips. And I'd love to talk to, through with you guys on this um, deeper. We've got a webinar we did, so you can go back and view that. Um, I know Peter's geeked out about this too, so he'd love to talk to you about it. Um, but really it's about, okay, so what are you selling? What are your chapters selling? Can you put a value on that? Um, are you getting revenue on that? And at the end of the day, how is that proving the ROI back to your association? We took it one step further, and we wanted to know what the value of our actual membership and our volunteer hours were if we had to replace all of our members with staff. Impossible to do, right? So we took a, a slightly different approach. We used actual um, average salaries from our association and put a value against that with the number of hours that I arbitrarily threw out on the table of how many hours a treasurer, a president, committee member, et cetera, work. I was shocked with the data, and as you can see in the little notes there, I suck at math. 
And so I did the data, and the number spit out is about $2 million in replacement value and actual ROI back to the organization. And I was like, hey, um, boss, can you just double check these numbers, make sure it works, because I'm not very good at it. And actually, I was correct. It was $2 million. So he's like, great, we've got the data. Let's go talk to um, our executive director and get you some help. And I was like, OK, so I have to do a PowerPoint presentation and this, that, and the other thing, you know, the boring stuff that um, CEOs or executive directors want to see on paper. And I chose, right, thank you, and I chose to do the wow factor first. So on the very first slide, I put on there what our ROI was um, for our investment. And it's an eight to one return that we're seeing between um, for what we're investing into our chapter network. Oh, by the way, all of our chapters are independent organizations. So I think that's even cooler because we have zero control over what they do. Um, we have relationships, we have contracts, things like that. But we don't dictate anything. We help when we guide them along. I got through the first slide and Mike goes, yep, OK, whatever you want, just do it. And I was like, no. I did this whole PowerPoint. It took me hours. And you're going to sit here and give me the 30 minutes that I booked on your calendar that took me five weeks to get on. Right? Exactly. So he's like, OK. He laughed. And he was like, yep, all right, I'll give you the time. No big deal. So I went through the whole thing, and I was like, OK, Mike, now what do you have besides yes, and you can do whatever you want now. Um, you know, I want your other feedback. I want to know what I did that was good, bad, and ugly. So next time we go through this, I know what to expect, and I know how to work the angle to get what you want out of me so then I can get what I want for me. And so we had a couple conversations. There wasn't a whole lot, but it was all about the data. That's what it comes down to, and you mentioned it too. If you can speak that language of data or ROI or this is my project plan, this is what I need, this is what I'm going to do, and this is the return. And the key thing that you said was whether it's an immediate return or a long-term return, it doesn't matter. Because if it takes five years to get the, the return on the investment, that's OK if the, if the return is large enough to prove that it's worthwhile for the original investment, right? So that worked. Um, I was, I'm in process of um, hiring the position that I want to help oversee all of the committees, um, the task forces, our volunteer engagement program, because I'm one person and I can't do it myself. And I was getting more and more pressure from my boss, the executive director, and of course the board, because now two of the board members that are on the current board were also sitting on the board that I served on at the local chapter. So they feel comfortable enough to come to me directly and circumvent the executive director, which I'm fine with. The executive director sure is not fine with that. <laughs> but that's, that's the cool part about this, right? So I spent a lot of time building relationships. When you have those really annoying all staff meetings and your executive director's up there for an hour spewing all this stuff, pay attention. Because what he's telling you is exactly how he wants to hear it back from you when you have something or want something or need an investment. Not everyone does that. What, what do we do in those meetings? We're on our phones. We're texting our coworker going, oh, this is a waste of time. I got 800 emails going on. By the way, are you going to happy hour tonight? <laughs> it's one of those things that that's the key piece of it. Build relationships with senior staff when um, the CFO comes to you and says, hey, I need to talk to you about your budget, or we have these questions. Spend as much time with those people as possible. Stop by their office. Hey, how's it going? Build that relationship just like you build relationships with your boards, with your chapters, um, with anybody that you're working with, because that's going to help you in the long run. If you have the social time, pick their brain a little bit. Find out um, about them. Find out about their job, what makes their job tough, and then go back um, to your desk and go, how can I make that person's job easier so I get more support and recognition when I want something from that C-suite? It works. It's tough. Um, but my biggest um, recommendation is start with the data you have. Don't go out there and say, I've got 50 um, places I can get data from. Start with five, perfect that, and then slowly add more. But don't take off, um, bite off more than you can chew. Thank you. That's my story. Great story.
Thank you. I met this next guy inadvertently when I was looking for fresh new models for um, chapters. But I was looking specifically for fresh new models for chapters that actually engaged people who were not boomers. And I ran into who is now the past president of the YPN uh, DC network. And w he just, just knocked my socks off. Um, this is the kind of person that we want in our chapters. Turns out he works in associations. He gets the whole thing about membership. But um, I think the coolest thing he's going to talk to you about is this whole idea of uh, embracing change. Yes, Kevin. Like a typical millennial, I'm going to use technology to assist me in daily life. <laughs> so, um, anybody, real quick, give me two words to describe millennials. Just any two words. Awesome and smart. I'll take those two. Thank you. I'm going to write those down, of course. All right. Awesome and smart. And this Wi-Fi is not being nice to me. All right. So what that means to me is that you guys really like me. Um, and Patrick, I do know what a rotary phone is, and I used an access database two days ago. But now there's an app for that. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I am a southern boy by heart. Grew up in North Carolina. Um, I can... <laughs> Worked at Bojangles, I can fry anything, I tell you. Um, Y'all, ma'am, and sir are like daily words in my life, all right? <laughs> um, I remember the sound of the internet, the dial tone, that whole ordeal, that was the sound of freedom. Now it's just uh, somebody actually heard that sound the other day and was like, what is that noise? I was like, oh my God. Um, and I, I feel like I'm well-educated. I have a bachelor's, two masters, and I'm working towards uh, applying for a PhD program. So. A little different than the typical millennial you may see recently. Um, I'm a proud Washingtonian, and my favorite holiday is five days away. All right? Oh. Um, now, I, I currently work for a company or a group called MSRDC. And I have to abbreviate that because our name is the literal longest name you will ever hear for an organization. It is a minority-serving institution of science, technology, engineering, and math research and development consortium. Oh. Yeah. So we shorten that as often as we can. Um, and in that role, I am actually head of the membership team. Um, I just turned 32 and just got put in that position, and I feel like I'm doing a lot for someone my age. Um, in addition to that, Peggy did mention, I serve on the board of the Young Nonprofit Professionals Network of Washington, D.C., equally long name. Um, we go by YMPN DC, and I think we have a special connection because we are a group that is dedicated to making sure the millennials feel engaged that they have the resources they need to be confident to walk up to the CEO with a great idea or with a director and say, look, I think there's something that I can improve on. That's what we do. We connect people with each other, with resources. And the name is a bit of a misnomer. We also welcome people who are not young nonprofit professionals. We welcome everybody. Um, and so that's why we're just a little different. Now, I am like your typical millennial. I love Starbucks. Chipotle is life. <laughs> <laughs> Delivery food is my go-to. Um, I recycle everything and I care about the environment. I am addicted to devices, if you couldn't tell. And Amazon is my best friend. Um, I don't own a house, don't have a car anymore. Literally sold it last week. Um, don't have kids. Um, but like all millennials, I'm crushed by student loan debt in the six-figure range. So that's why I have no 401k and no savings. <laughs> um, and I like to tell people I speak three languages. English, hashtag, and meme. <laughs> the, literally half of my text messages are memes. Um, but why does this matter? Well, does anybody in the room know who Chuck Underwood is? He is a speaker and a thought leader on the generational imperative. He's written a book called The Generational Imperative that literally discusses the differences between baby boomers and millennials and the communication gap between them and why it's so hard for us to not only communicate but get along sometimes. I met him. He's a great guy. Very amazing speaker, but he brought my eyes to some things. He said there are predisposed ideas about millennials. We gave the, the terms um, smart and awesome. I would love that. However, most of the terms we hear are the polar opposite. We hear that we're lazy, that we're disrespectful, disruptive, and close to criticism. Chuck does a great idea of saying, you know what, that's a little true, but it's also true that we're incredibly creative and open-minded, we're accepting of critique, and we're willing to actually challenge what we feel is something we can improve on. That's a, a skill, I think, that we bring as a culture. Um, we don't like the standard work environment. I've been in the position where I got up at 6 o'clock in the morning, had to get ready by 7, out the door, commuting at 8, at my desk by 9, 
sat at a desk for nine hours, including a one-hour lunch break, and then reverse course, went home, got in my gym shorts, and watched Netflix. You are mentally exhausted with that model. So that's why I'm proud to say that like, we, we approach this differently. We look at work as we have a choice where we work now. We openly look for things. For me personally, before I applied for any position, the first thing I said was, what, is your, what are your values? What are your community values? Do you value people's sexual orientation? Do you value diversity? Do you devalue thought leadership? These are things I wanted companies to tell me openly that they valued. So that is a proposition that I look for, that all of my friends look for, and something I'm glad that on the board I serve on, um, by the way, I've been on that board for three years. I served as chairman for six months, and let me tell you, getting a group of millennials together is like herding cats. <laughs> um, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and one of the things we did is we specifically went into our diversity statement, and we took three months to sit there and beat it, at, beat it to death, literally. We have one of the most comprehensive diversity statements you can imagine. It includes thought leadership, gender identity, sexual orientation, the standard federal reasons. And we go further and further every time we look at it. And that's something that we espoused. And we actually also in our bylaws put that because there are so many majority white boards that we wanted more diversity than anything else. We put that only 40% of our board can actually be Caucasian. The rest of it had to be diverse in terms of thought leadership and everything else. We wanted that diversity and it's paid off tremendously for us. We've done so much with such a diverse group of people and it's just been wonderful. Um, and for us, I feel that we value our work more than where we work. I worked for Pepsi that treated its employees like gold, but I was bored. I did the same thing. I worked in accounting, data. That's my whole life is data. And I was bored. And then I came to MSRDC and it pays significantly less, but <laughs> welcome to nonprofit. Um, but I like my work better. I feel like I have a better sense of purpose. And that's why one of my degrees is actually in nonprofit management. So as the world changes, some of the things that we look for and some of the reasons we want to engage in conversation are because some of the perks can outweigh some of the, some of the challenges. You know, one of the greatest places I worked literally had unlimited vacation. I had my own office and I could wear shorts to work. But I hated what I did. So I took a massive pay cut. Now I have the literal purple squirrel. Does anybody not know what the term purple squirrel is? Purple squirrel is a mythical creature, not so mythical actually. Um, it's an actual squirrel in nature that has a tint to its color that looks purple, but it's so rare that they call a rare individual or rare circumstance a purple squirrel. Um, at least that's how I took it. And I feel like I have a purple squirrel job because I get to work anywhere I want. I've literally been plugging away for hours in the back. Tomorrow I'm going to go to North Carolina and work. I can take Sunday off and Monday if I choose. I can do any schedule I want, but it's a very unique position. And that benefit alone has made me so happy to work for them. So why does this matter? It's because we want to look at the future. We want to tell you our long-term objective. How we're going to get there matters more than anything else. Because I want to say, look, I would love to be the ED about 15 years from now, and I will figure out how to get there, but that is my goal. We look so far forward that how we get there not going to lie, it's a series of stop and go moments. A couple of times I've literally looked around and gone, I don't even know what town I'm in, but we're going to make it work. <laughs> um, but we don't see the obstacles, we see the opportunity, which is what matters to us. So why I'm here is because I want to tell you that we want to change the conversation. It's no longer about benefits and what you bring to us and what we bring to you. To us, it's what is in your mind? Where do you see yourself going? What do you see yourself doing? Why is the future so important to you? And it's because the future matters to us. We're looking at the long term, not the short term. Um, and how can you engage us and how can we work better together? It's a common question. I can tell you there are 1,001 answers to every single question. But I can only tell you my experience is to engage us in conversation. Learn what works for us. Yeah, you can't give everybody everything they want, but you can at least find a common ground. Um, appreciate our work because, like Patrick said earlier, I work five, five weeks on this PowerPoint. You're going to give me my 30 minutes. <laughs> It's the truth. I've been in so many situations where I worked weeks on something and got five minutes. When I started demanding my time, I was more appreciated. So just simply appreciate the work we do. Sometimes it's something you can't see. Most of the time it's something you can. Teach us how to lead. Teach us how to grow and teach us how to lead others. That's what we want. We want to be in your shoes. We want to be there. But you need to show us. Honestly, I was never given the social skills early in life. I stumbled through it. 
The only reason I can give this speech right now is because my heart is racing a thousand miles a minute and I'm doing self-deprecation, so it's working. <laughs> um, but give us a chance to speak. Let us challenge the way that we do things. One of the great things that I love about millennials is that we're not afraid to challenge how things are done, to look outside the box, to say, this is what we should do, this is what we're doing, what do you think? Let's, let's try to talk about this. Let's, let's change the conversation. And finally, just let us blow your mind. If you give us the chance, I promise you, it'll be worth it. That's how we change a conversation. That's how we move forward. We want to lead. We want to grow. We just need you to engage us. So that's what the next generation I'm hoping is bringing, is at least the high spirits that I have and the future for tomorrow. You can always use me as a resource if you need to. And that's all, folks. Okay, so I got one more for you. Um, I put out a um, I put out a call on the ASAE um, Collaborate, and I said uh, I need a uh, a really cool CEO who thinks that chapters are okay. And I have to tell you, I got back like within hours a friend uh, saying, "Oh my gosh, have I got the person for you?" Not only does she think they're cool, but she's finding a way to really make sure they're part of an ecosystem that is serving a profession in a way that's never been done before. And so I'm so super excited to bring up Amy and let her tell you her story. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm so pleased to be here today. Um, Components is something that I really get excited about. I just want to like jump and um, I hope all of you do too and you see that here today. Um, I started in associations 18 years ago. Um, I actually started as the receptionist. I was at the front desk and I got really bored and after a month I was looking for a new job where membership was like come to membership and I was kind of like I'm an introvert. You really want me into membership? And it just grew from there. Um, 12 years ago, I became an executive director. But then when I flashed back to my childhood, I was like, associations have always been part of me. I didn't think I was going to be an association executive. I actually wanted to be in the Foreign Service running an embassy. But I was part of the United States Figure Skating Association growing up. And then I thought through all of academia, academia and that this is a great fit going forward. Um, here's my family on the bottom. I always feel like it's important so you can see what I'm doing when I am not here and when I am not working. I have two kids, Patrick and Ruthie, and that's already us on Halloween. And it's a Facebook preview because I, I only post on Halloween, um, Halloween photos, so you're all seeing that ahead of time. Um, I'm part of right now a company called MCI USA, and we provide uh, solutions to associations. Within that, I am Vice President of Member Engagement. So I help the associations that we provide solutions for in terms of membership, components, anything with that engagement strategy, communities as well. But within that, I serve as the Executive Director of the Special Libraries Association. And this is my team here. And this is how they are every time I talk about components and how I talk about what we need to do for them. They are jumping up. And here's me again, jumping up for joy, because you know what? I really do heart components. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit why I do and how that has infused um, the staff, the board, and is changing the culture of how we are um, building relationships and connecting um, with components. So the Special Libraries Association is almost 110 years old, so a lot of evolution over that time period. Um, it is a 501c3, um, and we have 4,000 members um, globally um, around the world. Um, within that, um, uh, and I love this slide because Sharon mentioned it in the beginning that as we work for our members, SLAs are at the heart. And this is a graph that we use quite a bit with our, with our components. Um, to show that we are one SLA. And it's really important uh, when I came on board to be executive director two and a half years ago, it was a lot of that self interest. And, you know, we are the pharmaceutical division. And so what, what that means in, in my, my language is these are librarians who work for pharmaceutical companies. And they were like, this is our conference and we do this. And I would go to events with the military librarians and they hadn't even heard of the Special Libraries Association. So they knew about a subset, but they didn't know about the larger group. 
we have 82 units. That's our word for components. Um, um, and so I'm going to probably interchange between the two of those throughout this presentation. Um, we have 82 units. Um, they are under group exemption. Um, and so we are the staff for the 82. None of them have their own staff. They're all volunteer driven. They each have their own nomenclature. And so we have chapters and then we have special interest groups which could be divisions or caucuses. So you're a president if you're a chapter, but you're a chair if you're with a division, okay? So all this like nomenclature, essentially it's the same thing, right? They're all doing activities, programs, trying to promote what they do, but also the interests of the organization. And um, all this kind of bureaucracy within that. What's even more so than that is we have 101 websites that the team that I have is responsible for keeping up to date. Now, not the content component, but all of the security and the updates and the plugins, they're on WordPress right now. Um, we're going to be moving to higher logic microsites very soon, just because that's one reason. WordPress, you can kind of do whatever you want. You don't know what the webmaster is going to do. With higher logic, we have a bit more uniformity there and can control that. And then we have 323 communities within Higher Logic, and that is growing um, every day. Um, and so some of our chapters have a public facing community because they want to be open to everybody, right? Librarians are social justice people, and they fight for the little guys, and they are like, well, why wouldn't we give all this information out for free? So they've got a community that's open up to everybody, but then they have a community that is open up to individuals have said, yes, put me in the Washington, D.C. chapter. Within our membership structure, um, once you join special libraries, you get um, uh, one chapter, and then one special interest group. That's included in your registration, in your membership. And then anything after that you do have to pay for. Um, and then we do also have 14 committees. We have like over 750 volunteers that we are managing with all of this. And so why is this conversation important? Why are we here today? Why do I value all the work that you do? And that's going to start out with these four drivers for me. Components are driving value, they're driving experience, they're driving connections, and that all leads to revenue. I love what Patrick was talking about and Kevin and Sharon with the data because the data is so important. Like, yes, um, you know, for special librarians, we're supposed to be feel good and kumbaya and we should be giving all these things away for free, but I can't make a decision without data, and I'm going to be looking at how that's driving revenue and how that's driving ROI going forward. Value is so important. Um, value is what is um, bringing those members back every day, right, with what the components do. The components are delivering X, Y, and Z. It's <laughs> delivering value. We know they're going to come back the next year. Very important. Experience overall, which I'll talk a little bit more later, that experience is key. And of course, the connections. Um, and what I find um, so valuable is that components serve as um, that engagement piece. They serve as an avenue um, for um, broadening the connections. And this is what I hear oftentimes, is that SLA, my component within SLA, this is my tribe. This is my family. I found the people I can connect with. I think that's all what we're doing right here, right? We found that and, oh, it feels so good, right? Well, that's what we want people within our components to say because from my perspective, if they found that value at a component level, first, awesome. You know what? We'll hone that, we'll massage it. Then that's going to come up to the next level and that's going to lead to the national organization or the international organization. Components um, drive the brand of the organization, right? So we're helping um, components are looking at what we're doing on social media. How are they retweeting it? I was just getting a bunch of retweets here. Um, we have a salary survey going out and our components right now are retweeting. They're liking, they're sharing, they're pushing that out because you know what? They want the content in that salary survey to be just as impactful as I do because they want to be able to go 
to their organization. They want to have conversations within their um, regional area about salaries and being competitive and what they can do within a market. It's really important. Components drive careers. Right here we're talking about it. We're driving Patrick's career, Sharon's, Kevin's. They are so key to that, personally and professionally, right? So personally, being a volunteer leader, starting out at a component, you know, getting your feet wet, and then you consider running for that international or national board of directors. Um, Career-wise, um, professionally too, giving you the skills, giving you a mentor maybe locally that you, you meet with and that you can grow with. Components are really key to that. So what do I look for or what do CEOs look for in a component experience? Well, fun, obviously. Um, I'm all about fun, working hard, and playing hard. And um, if you think the components, I know some components do have staff in this room. Some are all volunteer driven. If it wasn't fun, we wouldn't be coming back. And that's really important there. And so to kind of sum what we've been saying, right, is that an association serves as that act global, right, or act national. And then chapters serve as that ability for individuals to connect within their area and have that face-to-face -face connection probably more frequently than they would, you know, at the national, international level. And then the special interest groups, enabling them to hone in on an area in a group there. And that's really key. Um, <clears throat> what I look for in an experience and what we're changing is we don't want any component to feel like a number and to just feel like I'm another, you know, person calling another president and they have X complaint. We want them to make them feel that they are the only ones. And we've kind of changed that customer service. Um, within the library world, which you can probably imagine, and I don't mean to stereotype, but they can be somewhat more introverted. And so they're very willing to write that email. And that email might be harsh sometimes, and it really gets punches the staff in that gut. When they get them on the phone, oh yeah, it's wonderful here, it's great. And, and so we need to change our culture that they are important in emails we send out in written words. And just so that is when we get them on the phone, it's really important. The storytelling is what I look for. I want to hear the stories of the components. I want to hear about that organic growth going on. I want to hear about what is exciting members. Um, we just launched, um, and, well, we just announced that we are going to Charlotte for our 2020 conference, and that was quite controversial because in 2016, we had pulled out of Charlotte because of the bathroom bill. We were supposed to be there this year in 2018. Um, we deferred it if it got repealed, and there's a whole controversy about that I'm not going to go into, but we announced it last week. Every single facet of that communications, really crisis communication plan to announce that, dealt with the units. And who were we going to contact for the units? How were we going to reach out to them ahead of time? Who were we going to contact? That was part of that whole plan. And you know what? It was kind of silent after we made that announcement. And you know why? We did that right outreach. We did the right steps. We got the feedback, and we listened. Before we made the announcement, we reached out to key individuals within our components, and we got their feedback. And we thought, how can we really take this and move forward? And it tweaked what we were doing. We changed it to be part of the solution. So always let your components be heard. It's really important. Let them be heard. So do as much listening. Let them be heard. Take the time. Take a breath if they're on the phone. And maybe it's the member that uh, gonna, you know is going to talk for 10 minutes. Just let them talk for 10 minutes. If they're going to feel good, they just want to be heard. So what do I need from um, component relations professionals? Um, these are some of the adjectives, things that came to my mind right away and that I looked for when I made um, two hires um, for the Special Libraries Association. We have two individuals. They do cross membership and components um, that work um, primarily on it. Um, being here today and hearing Kevin and Sharon and Patrick talk about data, I should have probably put something with data on here. But I do think that that does support all of these, the ability to communicate. I want the time with my 
uh, membership, my component relations people. I want them to present new ideas. I don't want to keep feeding them ideas. Um, I want them to bring that to, uh, to me. I'll take any time you want. Put it on my calendar and let's go. Let's work through this. And um, don't be afraid to do that. So my, one of my sayings is membership is the result of doing everything else well and right. But I would say components are that secret sauce to that membership doing everything else well and right. So a call to action um, here is that passion led you all here. Okay, how can your passion move you to that next step within your career path, whatever that may be, or that next step to get that initiative proposed or that action? Um, be the leader, okay? We're all leaders in this room. Everyone's a leader, I, I believe that. Everyone's a leader in a different way, so how can you be the leader that, that you wanna be and aspire to be that going forward? Be heard, don't be shy, share those ideas. I wanna hear them. You're on the front lines um, as component relations. You're getting what people really want. What's going to be the next big thing? Or how can the organization be more nimble? Perhaps it's a too bureaucratic structure and you're hearing that you're not finding volunteers, you're not hearing that. That's what the organization needs to know because if the organization doesn't hear that, it's a very long-term problem and it might not, you might not have a dip in membership at that moment, but in a decade or 15 years from now, it could. So think about the impact that you can have going forward there. This is my favorite quote. I love this quote. Maybe if you've seen me speak before, I've used it. I just always have to slip it in there and I slipped it in last minute because to do the work you love and you know that it matters, what could be more fun, right? What could be more fun with what we do? And think about that every day. You are making an impact. You do have relevancy. And keep doing what you're doing. So um, with that, please connect with me if you have any questions or anything. And um, thank you. So um, Amy, question for you. Yeah. Did you reach out to component volunteer leaders through one-on-one -on -one outreach in person or phone, or did you did the groups sort of reach out to each other? For Charlotte, well, um, I'll just speak broadly okay. um, with that. Um, certainly, I think email can be effective. Uh, my preference really is making phone calls. I will sit there and make phone calls. Um, oftentimes, my component relations mm -hmm. folk will say, can you just call these folks, just check in, like I think they just need some TLC, they just want to be heard. Um, and so to me, I'd rather do that. Maybe that's old school, because I'm, I'm not the millennial and I'm not shying away <laughs> from the phone, um, but I prefer that. Um, this past year, I tried to do as many visits as I could, um, so both to chapter, but then to our special interest group meetings and connect. Um, I even did one to Malaysia um, because of the global and that was so impactful because I was able to connect with our Arabian Gulf chapter and our members in India and otherwise it's like maybe one connection point and it's at SLA's conference. You know how hard, that's so hard for me to like have like a meaningful conversation mm -hmm. about how we're going to drive membership growth engagement in those regions of the world when I'm responsible for the conference at the time. So going to other events has really been helpful. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a well-rounded thing. Um, I do monitor social media, which maybe that's odd for a CEO. I, I'm into social media, so I don't mind it. I do. Okay. <laughs> I don't mind it. Um, so I'm always like, oh my gosh, this is going to become an issue. Like, we've got to get on this. But I want to know what that back channel is going on um, with the units um, because that could lead to something bigger. In the example of Charlotte, um, the the units, the components all got together and it was like, it was just this machine that was going that we need to pull out of Charlotte, we need to pull out of it. And SLA couldn't get ahead of it and be proactive. We were reacting the whole time. And if we had done more of this one-on-one -on -one outreach, we wouldn't have had that machine roll in. Excellent, excellent. Okay, uh, let's see. Bachelor number one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm if you engaged. had a million dollars in cash okay, to use only with components of your organization, what would you want to see uh, done? If you only a had million if, yeah, a million dollars. Ooh. Um, a million dollars. My God, I don't even know where to start with that one. Um, I'd probably hire staff for every single component. Okay, 
and a Gulf Stream for each as yep. well. Okay, cool beans. <laughs> yep. uh, so, uh, Kevin, what are associations doing that turn off millennials? Uh, I guess it's really not appealing to something that matters to us. Um, and that's a very, very broad statement. For me, I guess, if I am just walking around every day and I see a sign that says, hey, you need this, my response is, hmm, why do I need it? If you just tell me what I need, you tell me what I'm going to do, I'm going to tell you no. If you say, this is the next big thing, this is why it matters, and this is how it impacts your daily life, check us out. That phrase, check us out, actually matters more than you telling me what I want. It's me telling you what matters to me. I think that's the biggest turnoff is when uh, someone tells me what I want or what I need. My answer is, no, I don't, and see you later. I think that's just our mentality, really. Good answer. Good answer. Thank you. Uh, Sharon, what's the most memorable pitch request you've ever received? Uh -huh. Oh, sure. gosh. Um, you know, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Most of it, I, I'm actually going to pitch back to what my colleague, my millennial colleague over here is, and that I have a millennial. And actually, she didn't ask. She just told me she was moving to Williamsburg. So we, um, we're a virtual organization. And she is critical to communications and membership. And so we sat down and we had a conversation on what the parameters would be in terms of where she can work because of the legal implications. So not so much that, no, I don't want you to move, but I, my number one priority is to protect the corporation. And so here are the parameters. And so now I have a traveling millennial who works for me, and I let her work how she wants and That's when exactly she wants. That's exactly what I do every day. And I will never lose her because of it. <laughs> OK, so. Amy, uh, you talked about components driving your brand. So what if you have a component that's hurting your brand? How do you handle? and? How does your organization, organization handle that stuff? <laughs> yeah, we've had, um, we've had several of those. Um, uh, the first one that comes to mind um, is this one division. They always had their own meeting um, on their own, and it would be like three months before SLA's annual conference. And, um, you know, think about a member trying to pick which one you go to if they can, or if they can't afford to go to both. What do you do? And then you think of the industry partner side, the vendors, they are going to both or they're picking. And so our thought was, why don't we bring that meeting into the annual conference and have it a meeting within a meeting, or whatever you want to use for that terminology. And um, that took over two years to do because of their negativity. And then they started to get the group think going within the broader membership um, and so then it wasn't just that one division, the pharmaceutical division, saying that. It was then all these other divisions. Why would you do that? And um, there has to be some something that you're covering up and all this negativity. So then no other group wanted to partner with us in those two years either when it was like a win-win. And so we had to sit down with them um, repeatedly. And sometimes it takes that to get along that path. I think sometimes mm -hmm. in an association you might be right too soon, if that makes sense. So like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good idea, but it, you got to kind of change that mindset. Well, I was rolling this out within like two months of me being CEO that we should do this. So of course they were like, no, we're not doing this. I don't care who you are. You're not bringing this much change to um, the organization that quickly. Um, and so we got that to change and it was a great partnership this year. Um, but it took time, and, and how we solved that was greater communication, having the data, right? So two months in, I didn't even really know all the culture and the nuances, and like probably stepped in some minefields as well, and the whole staff changed over. So it took a little while to figure out how can we work this person? How can we do that? And what angle to take? And so knowing that and talking to other board members, what's the best approach to this? And we did tweak that along the way based on where we were in that conversation. And then it just took that right volunteer to be like, I've been listening to this conversation for two years. This is what we need to do and helping us do that. OK, good, yeah. good, good response and good segue to the next question. Uh, and probably for Sharon, uh, but you all might want to weigh in on this, because I think I know where this question is coming from. <laughs> um, so it, it says, I feel like I run up against that inertia when wanting to make a more strategic change. And we've seen boards tend to do the group mm -hmm. think thing. They tend 
you know, they, they regress to the lowest common denominator in any decision-making process. So how do I break that sort of log jam that occurs when the board won't see where we're trying to go? I could write a book on that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I actually just put a session in for annual meeting on using DISC to diminish and diffuse conflict, board conflict. So this was a similar question that was asked to me in a different way when I was going through the search process with this particular position and how do you handle difficult people? I had a toxic board member who was harassing me quite a bit and the way I answered that question and this is the start to how I handled it is through evaluation, education and empathy. So that kind of goes back to what Amy was saying, and you have to take the time. I'm sitting here nodding my head because over the last, um, so I'm going to use governance because you guys all deal with governance, right? We just, after three years, put through, through government's transformation at NSH. The House of Delegates passed 100% of the bylaws changes to how we are structuring our president, to how we are staggering our terms. Policy is now owned by the Board of Directors, which was the sacred cow, is sacrosanct. The board finally owns it, not the House. We eliminated a judicial committee, which posed significant risk to us um, for exposure to liability and defamation of character. We also eliminated disciplinary actions. You can imagine what that's like, because it's legislated in your bylaws. How we got there was through evaluation, understanding, I'm a huge fan of systems thinking. You know, the five whys, you know, root cause analysis, really understand what is driving the, the, the problem or what problem are you trying to solve. Then through the evaluation, we added education. So the way the motion was written for this particular uh, task force was the governance review task force would be established to study governance and then make recommendations to the House of Delegates by 2017 for recommendations and consideration. So we had them study governance before they even got to problem solving. Then they wanted to solve problems like, wait a minute, we haven't agreed upon yet what the issues are. So then we got everybody to agree on the issues by using all the techniques that Amy did. I pick up the phone a lot. I'll also text and I do all the social media, but what I have found is that human connection and giving time to people makes all the difference in the world. Then we agreed upon the problem and then we worked on a solution and then we did webinars, we did newsletter articles, we had phone conversations and talked to people to educate the delegates and it all passed. Good stuff, good stuff. Okay, so we have one minute left so I'm gonna, Patrick, I'm gonna hit you with one last, actually, let me hit uh, Kevin with the impo most important question we have here. Mm -hmm. It says, Kevin, you are unbelievably, all caps, successful. <laughs> How old are you? I am 32. <laughs> there we go. Hey, do we need to know anything else? <laughs> okay, so we have lots of other questions here that are some really good questions. What I'm gonna suggest we'll do is probably forward them out to you guys and share out their answers to you guys. Because I think we've had a pretty phenomenal conversation here, giving everybody a sense of where the opportunities are for the, the community, component relations community. So I think a big round of applause for our team of four. Yay, yay.